So, I'm Natalie Anderson. I'm a senior here at Spring Arbor studying biology, and this summer I was at the University of Virginia for 10 weeks doing research through their summer research internship program. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the exact research I did, and then also just a little bit about my program at the end specifically. So, the main question that I was researching in the Vanderpool lab, which is in the Department of Pathology at the University of Virginia, is does HPV or human papillomavirus 16E6 modulate CADM1 function in epithelial cells? And as I go throughout the presentation, I'll talk more about exactly what this means. So the papilloma in human papillomavirus stands for warts. And low risk types of HPV cause warts. And there are also high risk types of HPV, which um, can leave you at risk of having cancer from the virus. So. HPV affects not only humans, but other vertebrates, such as the cow, giraffe, and dolphin you see here. Um, my mentor in the lab, sh she was actually so um, passionate about HPV that she has a picture of a cow with warts on it similar to this hanging in her office. So, very interesting. So the exact mechanism of HPV infection is that through cuts, um, they can be very small abrasions, things, you know, cuts that you can't even see. The virus enters the skin, and it, an initial infection occurs at this basal cell layer, which is the very bottom of the layers of skin, and those basal cells will differentiate and turn into um, squamous epithelium as they differentiate and rise to this very surface of the skin. So once the virus infects the cells at the basal layer, basal layer the genome is copied in the cells and packaged as it moves up towards the surface, and newly um, made viruses are then able to escape once they reach the surface and infect new cells. So this is what the HPV virus um, looks like in a ribbon diagram. So the specific region that my lab was interested in was this blue region here, which is the C-terminal region. And through previous experiments that my lab has done, um, they found that this region can bind a specific type of domain that's found on a lot of proteins called a PDZ domain. Um, and I'm just going to sum up for you a little bit of what my lab has found in the past and what they think is going on. So they have found that the HPV virus can interact with this PDZ domain that then binds a protein called DLG. DLG then can bind in a three-part complex the proteins MPP7 and LIN7, and this occurs in a LIN7 dependent fashion, meaning that DLG can only bind MPP7 when LIN7 is present. And then MPP7 can bind a transmembrane protein in the cell called CADM1, or cell adhesion molecule 1. And this protein is the whole reason that my lab was interested in this complex. Um, cell adhesion molecule 1 is a tumor suppressor. So my lab thought it made a little too much sense that a specific type of human papillomavirus, 16E6, that's high risk and can cause cancer, is binding um, a protein that binds a, two other proteins that then binds a tumor suppressor. So we think that maybe HPV is somehow modulating this tumor suppressor's function and then causing cells to become cancerous. So our hypothesis was that the HPV 16E6 is associating with CADM1 through this specific complex that I just showed you. And how we tested this um, is we transfected 293T cells, which is a human embryonic kidney cell line, um, with plasmids that encoded for the different proteins of interest that we had, which were the proteins that I just showed you. And we plated that in various combinations to see how different proteins would react with each other, and then waited 18 hours for the cells to grow up. Then we lysed these cells, broke them open to get all the protein inside, and did two different types of assays, immunoprecipitation and a pull-down assay, which I'll explain, to try and figure out how exactly are these proteins binding together. Are they binding together in the way that we thought that they were? Um, so that's what we were checking out. And the first type of test that I did was called an immunoprecipitation, and the best thing that I can compare this to is fishing. So in an immunoprecipitation experiment, you're using an antibody, that is specific for a tag on your protein of interest. Um, and then therefore, once you put that antibody into your plate with your lysed cells, that antibody will attach or hook that protein of interest. And then once you precipitate that antibody out, you can figure out what other proteins are bound to your protein of interest. And then these were the results from the first immunoprecipitation I did. I know it looks really confusing, but on the left here we have the inputs, which just show what proteins were in each of our samples. The samples are 
each vertical slot. And then over here we have our immunoprecipitation, which you know, shows the results of the experiment. And in this immunoprecipitation, we were using a MYC tagged antibody, which was specific for the MPP7 protein, um, which I showed you earlier. So we were trying to figure out, okay, what is MPP7 binding within these cells? So in our input, when we had MPP7 present, when we immunoprecipitated with our MYC tagged antibody, we did find that MPP7 immunoprecipitated, which is what we were expecting. Then when we probed for LIN7, we found that yes, LIN7 was present, but only when MPP7 was present as well, which goes along with you know, our su supposed complex that my lab had thought of. So then DLG, is our other protein that we probed for, and we found that DLG was only present when MPP7 and LIN7 were present, which again checks out with our hypothesis. CADM1 was the same way. CADM1 was present when the MPP7 protein was present. And this all checks out with our hypothesized structure for this protein complex. Then in the second immunoprecipitation, we were now using CADM1 as our hook to fish out proteins and see what else would bind, and we get very similar results. So MPP7 was immunoprecipitated with CADM1 because they, you know, they bind to each other. And then DLG was precipitated when MPP7 and LIN7 were present. And you can see specifically here how, yes, it was in a tripart fashion and in a LIN7 dependent fashion because the only two difference between these two samples right here is that LIN7 was not present in this sample and DLG did not show up in our, um, in our immunoprecipitation there. So this also checks out with our hypothesized complex structure. And then the second type of test I did is called a pull-down assay, which is very similar to immunoprecipitation, except your hook in this instance is a specific genomic sequence on um, your protein of interest that binds the other proteins. So that would be the PDZ binding domain of CADM1. So you cut that off, put it on a GST protein, which has a high affinity for a GSH bead, and then you precipitate those beads out and you can find, okay, what was binding that portion of CADM1? And again, our results were consistent with our hypothesis. MPP7 bound CADM1, LIN7 bound MPP7, and then DLG bound, but only when both LIN7 and MPP7 were present. So this checks out with our hypothesis. So in conclusion, both the immunoprecipitation and pull-down assays that I conducted did support the hypothesized DLG protein complex structure, and I was able to set up a good system of transient transfection of 293T cells with which now we can add the HPV 16E6 virus into the equation. And if I'd had a few more weeks there, I would have loved to do this myself to see how maybe HPV can change how these proteins interact. So for future research, again, adding um, the HPV virus into the assays, and then utilizing different cell lines I think would also be of value. We did run into some problems with the 293T cells. Um, we wouldn't be able to visualize proteins in certain instances where they really should be there, and we think that maybe just troubleshooting this with a different cell line could be valuable. And ultimately, we want to find out if modulating the function of CADM1 is another method of how this HPV virus um, causes epithelial cells to become cancerous. And if we figure that out, we could possibly create um, drugs in the future that could prevent that from happening. So just a little bit about my program. So it was actually through the School of Medicine at the University of Virginia, um, and it's called the Summer Research Internship Program. It was 10 weeks, and they also included a professional development series um, throughout the program, which is where faculty and different students, alumni of the program, um, came and spoke about what exactly they do, what research they do, what their vocation is, and we just got to hear from you know a lot of different career paths with the research that we were conducting. And then there were communicating science workshops, which I thought were super valuable. So this program did a really good job of placing an emphasis on, okay, an important part of science is making sure that we can communicate that science to people who maybe aren't so familiar with it themselves. Um, so those workshops were really great and we learned a lot of good skills with putting together presentations and speaking and you know how to get complex ideas across. And then the travel housing and the stipend were all covered by the program, which is one of the reasons that I chose this program. They were very generous um, with their stipend and with taking care of all of us students. So that was a big reason that I chose to do one of these as well. And we weren't just in the lab all the time at UVA. 
Um, there were tons of fun things to do in Charlottesville, Virginia. It was a really fun city. Um, it, they had a lot of city life, but it was also nice to you know get out in the country. We went on some hikes. We went to some lakes. Um, and altogether, Virginia was just a beautiful place. I'd never been to the East Coast before, and I had a really good time there. So here are my references. And this all wouldn't have been possible without the Vanderpool Lab, who took me under their wing this summer, showed me how to do everything. Um, and then Dr. Janet Cross and Maria Johnson, who uh, created the whole SRIP program and helped to run it this summer. And then also just my UVA SRIP team. I made so many good friends this summer, people that I still talk to today, and people that I expect I'll stay friends with for a very long time. And then also my Spring Arbor um, professors, I would not have been able to do this without them. Dr. Wyman, Dr. Baldwin, Dr. Bradovich, and Dr. Newhouse all wrote me letters. I applied to 12 different programs, so there were a lot of letters of rec that I needed, and they were super helpful with this whole process. Um, so I just wanted to thank them as well. Thank you.